Good morning, how are we all doing? If you're not doing well, then you weren't listening to the choir. Uh, those young ladies that were singing this morning, I've listened to a lot of choirs, trust me. The harmony and the joy and them smiling, uh, if that doesn't make you rejoice, then you need to go to the meal afterwards. That will, because if it's the same energy that you place into cooking as you did into singing, I know the food's going to be good. So with anticipation, I'm thanking you for the preparation of the food. Uh, I love to see the joy of the Lord on people's faces. Uh, I always say smile. It doesn't matter if they're your teeth or not. Long as they're, all, long as they're glued in, okay? Because I, everyone here has uh, some type of uh, teeth that perhaps are not yours, like myself. And, uh, but thank God that we can smile. There, it doesn't cost much to be a blessing, to make me a blessing to someone today. I'll tell you, you folks have been a blessing to me just to see the spirit here. Uh, and I just don't say that because if there's no spirit, I'm not going to lie. I got to preach. And I just, don't, I just don't say things to say things. If I give you a compliment because I mean it. If I don't give you a compliment because you haven't done anything to be complimented on. Right? So we, we, need, we, need to be, we need to be honest in our Christian lives. We need to be honest one with another. Uh, I appreciate uh, your pastor. I've, I preached when he was in Arizona. I was talking with him last night. I can still remember the layout on the building in the parking lot, the gravel, where the door was located. All his children were small. Uh, I don't know if he remembered. I had hair back then. And uh, it, was just, it was just a thrill uh, to see what God does over a period of years. Uh, I'm excited for this church because this church, the potential that sits here is amazing. And God can use every one of us long as we have an interest in what he's interested in, long as we get involved and we invest. But now I want to talk about three other things, characteristics about us. The head, the heart, and the hands. The head, the heart, and the hands. If you look with me in the Word of God in Romans chapter 9, all of us care about someone. If you have a mother that's still alive, you care about her. Or when she was alive, my, both my parents are in the presence of the Lord. I remember uh, caring. I, care is concerned about reaching everyone. My concern when my mother was alive, when my father was alive, meeting their needs. I'd do anything because always in my head, in my heart, and with my hands, I would show my concern for my parents. I remember uh, when my son was living in his last moments. For 11 hours, I held him in my hands as he bled all over my shirt because I couldn't lay him down because his organs were just too painful for him to lay down, to bend over. So I had to hold him. 200 and some pound uh, child. I remember uh, my mother when uh, she couldn't see that well and when she was diagnosed with uh, uh, cancer, pancreatitis cancer, I remember going up to her and I said, it's your favorite son, Ed, give me your hand. And I says, you feel that? She goes, yeah, just like your grandfather. I says, that's right, mother. And she would touch the top of my head. She says, you're bald, aren't you? I says, good, good observation, mother. But see, we do with these hands what we feel in our heart that is affected by our head. The eye affecteth the heart. That's why when we saw these clips or these pics or these pictures, that's the most important thing to me as people. Every one of you is important. The people in Seattle are important. The people around this church are important. The people in this state is important. The people in this country is important. And the people around the world are important. Why? Because they're important to God. That's why he came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For whomso shall ever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Romans chapter 9, I want to give you this morning something that would be profitable about the Apostle Paul. I love Paul. Why? Because he was a missionary. I love Paul because he was bold. 
Paul had, as we say in Spanish, no tenía pelos en la lengua. He didn't have hair on his tongue. He spoke the things as he felt free to speak. We need to be careful that we don't become politically correct as we have. I'm not politically correct, by no means. I tell it the way it is. I'm not like Joel Osteen, stand up there and smile and will not disclose the consequences of hell because the Bible speaks about hell. And we need to be careful that we don't sugarcoat the gospel to make people feel good. I'm not in Christianity to make people feel good. I'm to rescue them from a place of eternal condemnation. It's called hell. That's my purpose in life. Now, will I be kind? Yes, I will be kind. Will I be cordial? Yes. Will I be sympathetic? Yes. But I will be direct because I have a message that's very important. And the Bible teaches us in chapter 9 of Romans, it says, I say the truth in who? Christ. I lie not. My conscience, my head, my mind also beareth me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. I wonder this morning, how many of us have sorrow for someone that's not saved? Does it bother us when we pass by a homeless individual? Or we see a drug addict? Or we see a criminal? Or we see someone without Jesus Christ? Or when we travel and we see an atheist? Or we see a heathen? Does that bother you and I? When you see people suffering in beds of affliction in the hospitals, I, I always rec I love going to three places when I go to a city. I love going to the church. I love going to the cemetery, and I love going to the hospital. Because the hospital is just one step out of the cemetery. And the cemetery is eternity. And we all have to pass that way. And I like to keep my heart in the right condition. I thank God every day when I wake up, I can go vertical. I thank God that I can still put my feet on the floor. The only time I want to go horizontal when it's time to sleep. I don't want to spend my whole life horizontal. I don't want to lay down all my life. I want to do something that's productive. And Paul here says that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren. You talk about a sacrifice. You talk about a willingness. You talk about his conduct. Not only did he have it in his head, not only did he have it in his heart, but he had it in his hands in his way to show his love for people. He was willing to be a curse. He was willing to be separated from the Lord Jesus Christ for the love of the people. How many of you love your children? Enough, enough to give your life that they may live. Of course, every one of us, as good parents, we would do that for our children. We would do that for our parents. And our parents, vice versa, would do it for us. Here we have the Apostle Paul willing to give himself a cursed that the folks would be saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray and ask that our care this morning, our concern about reaching everyone, the Jew, the Gentile, the young, the old, the male, the female. Lord, we know you're not a respecter of persons. I pray and ask that you help us to open our eyes to have a vision that's worldwide. I think of yesterday as we walked through Seattle, the multitudes of people looking to fulfill the pleasures of life, doing their own agenda, trying to please and to satisfy the void that exists. Even today, many awake only to seek something that's not fulfilling, that's not satisfying. Lord, we have what people need. I pray and ask, Lord, that we be concerned this morning that we would examine what we really care about. Lord, bless us, guide us, and direct us. Help us to live a life that would be pleasing unto Thee. Help us to think in our heads and feel in our hearts and react with our hands in proclaiming the gospel that You've given to us. Bless each one of us this morning is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I don't know about you, but I love people. You say, there you go again, talking about people. It's all about people. I enjoy going to weddings. Why? I like watching people cry. I really do. Because tears are language that only God understands. Some people cry for joy. Some people cry for sorrow. We have people that cry at weddings. We have people that cry at funerals. We have people that cry over pets. Did you ever cry for one of your pets? I, I did when I was a little kid. When my dog ran away, I cried. Say, oh, you're a sissy. No, that's just a human reaction when there's sorrow. We cry. I, I remember going in. I mentioned in Sunday school when I went to the architect. I went to an electrical engineer. And I walked into his office. And the secretary, this was in Costa Rica, she was sitting there crying. And I says, ma'am. I says, what's wrong? She goes, she died. I says, who died? She goes, and she mentioned her name. <coughs> I says, is she your sister or is she your, she goes, no. I says, who is she? She goes, the lady on the soap opera. <laughs> How many of you ever watched something on television that brought a tear to your eye? But my question is this, do we cry about people that are alive, that are real? Are we sorrowful for the condition of our co-labor? Our neighbor that lives next to us? Or someone we know very close and dear to our hearts that's not saved? Do we have that continual sorrow that I pray for my brother that he gets saved? He's getting closer. He's much closer to going into eternity than to staying here. He needs to get saved. And every time I see him, I remind him, have you come to the point in your life where you need the Savior? Or are you still trusting in yourself? Look with me, if you would, in chapter 10. Verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. In his head continually Paul thought about people, thought about their spiritual condition. When he went into Athens, when he saw the whole city given unto idolatry. When I went downtown Seattle yesterday and I saw the diversity of the people, the cultures, my heart was stirred. I thought to myself, boy, what would it have been like to go into Athens to see them making to the unknown God they had a statue. They had everything. They had fountains. They had the rock and roll museum. They had the war. They had everything. Saw a lady over there with a microphone explaining why she believes this. And there was a group of about two, three hundred people. Then you go down a little bit further. You saw a guy with the guitar. Now, I don't know about you. When I pass by those people, I think about their souls. Because my interest is in people. And I saw one guy standing there talking to himself. He wasn't, no one around, he's just talking to himself, playing the guitar. And I thought to myself, where in life did he get off the road of living a pure, separated life? What caused him to get involved into drugs or into the rock and roll. Seattle has quite a history on music. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, you say, why? Because I used to be interested in music. That's why I can tell and distinguish a good song when it's from the heart. And it's amazing how those individuals, their whole head and their heart was in it. <coughs> See, when I was a little kid, we played baseball. Uh, any of you played baseball when you were younger? Uh, uh, I grew up back east. And baseball and football and soccer were very big. Soccer was very big when I was a child because of the European, the influence in the coal mining and steel mills. Now, when I was a little kid, I wasn't big enough to play. I was only five years old. I wasn't big enough to play baseball with my brothers and my uh, neighbors. They were all 9, 10, 11. But I wanted to play baseball. It was always in my head, in my heart. I want to play baseball. I want to do something. And I remember one of my neighbors saying, you want to play ball, Eddie? Here's what you can do. You can chase the foul balls. We had woods around the baseball field. So when the ball would go foul, you know what I would do? I would run into the woods and get the ball. 
it occurred to me they can't continue the game until I brought back the ball. So one day, I picked up the ball and I'm back there lollygagging with it. You understand lollygagging? Okay, if you don't, I'm dating myself. I just throwing it up in the air and my brother comes into the woods and says, what's taking you so long? I said, you can't play until I, he smacked me upside the head. He says, don't you be doing, I was participating in the baseball game by fetching foul balls. But I was doing something. My friends would laugh at me. They says, what are you doing? You're just chasing foul balls. Yeah, but soon I'll be playing. Next year, because I was participating in foul balls, they put me in right field and let me bat number nine. Then soon I moved in to shortstop. And before long, I was pitching. See, everything has a process, but it starts with what's on our mind. Then it passes to our heart and passion for people. And then it is demonstrated in our hands. If you want to tell a man what a man's about, you can look at a man's hand and you can tell. You can look at a lady's hands and tell if she has dishpan hands. Oh, they don't do that anymore. You don't wash dishes by hand anymore, do you? do you? How many of you remember washing dishes by hand before they had the dishwasher? You remember you had the dishwasher and you had the dryer and then you had the one to put them away? That's why you had all those kids. Remember that? I used to be in the slave labor camps. <laughs> but we were participating. And we were part of the program. And we weren't playing around with text. We weren't goofing around on the internet. We weren't doing everything. We were concerned about doing a responsibility, a duty. And that was participating in the chores around the house. Whether it be cutting the grass, whether it be washing dishes, whether it be cleaning the anoleum floors whether it be shoveling snow, but we were all doing something because our head was in the game. Our head was in the program. This morning, is our head in the program of reaching folks for Jesus Christ? Paul had a continual sorrow in his heart. Our conscience bears witness of speaking the truth. We first need to recognize it, then we need to receive it, and then we need to respond. Most people don't recognize there's a lost and dying world. Seven point Four billion people in the world. Do you recognize that they need Jesus Christ? In Korea, you think they need, folks need Jesus Christ in Korea? Sure. In China, you think so? Sure. In Germany, yes. In Africa, yes. South and Central America, yes. Here in Seattle, do they need Jesus Christ? See, we can sit around, and do you think the politicians are going to do it? My question is this. I have a question for every American. Which one do we put in office? Which one? So is our hope in Washington? Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we, our head needs to be focusing on what we can do in order to help individuals. Because no one's going to help anyone. I was talking, I have a, a ministry, Spanish ministry church in Stockton, California. The worst city in the United States to live in. Check it out, unemployment. One of the ladies in the, mini, in the ministry there, she's a social service. She tells me that 60% of the city of Stockton, 240,000, are on some type of government subsidy. In other words, your tax dollars and my tax dollars pay for their laziness. And as you walk through and around the area, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted, every store, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted. Nobody wants to work. And those that do work, they don't really work. They come in late, they leave early, and they do nothing. You're all smiling because you work with them. And they want entitlements. And they want an easy job. Well, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about Christianity. We need laborers because laborers are few. The harvest is plenty. He says, pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth what? Laborers. This is serious. We're talking about souls. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about lives 
of people that you and I love. Our head, our conscience bears witness. Are we compelled? It's the love of Christ that constraineth me. I don't serve to please the pastor. I don't visit to please the people. I visit because people need what you and I have. Do we believe that? Remember Paul Harvey? If you believed it, you would live it. I, you listen to him every day on the radio. How many of you ever heard Paul Har Harvey? If you don't know who he is, just, just Google it or whatever. That is Sarah's or whatever her name is on the iPhone. Just say Paul Harvey. He come on and always make a phenomenal statement. See, if we really believed in the Word of God, we would begin to live it. You and I, conscience of the need, the heart. There's a place, everyone. He had a, he had a place in his heart for the people of Israel. Nehemiah had a place for, in his heart for Jerusalem. Esther had a place in her heart. Christ had a place in his heart for us. Paul had a place in his heart for us. What's in our heart today? What's in your heart today? What's in my heart today? Is it people? People, my brethren. Verse 2 of chapter 10, it says, For I bear record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Yesterday, when Edwin and I were walking through Seattle, we saw... A Methodist church we saw a Presbyterian church and I'm sure in those churches pastor years ago they preach the gospel I'm sure years ago those churches I saw a young lady over here with the hat on I remember when I was a young that's that's how the young ladies dressed they all had the little Easter hats on with the little white uh, uh, shoes on and we used to put our shoes we only got shoes once a year it was Easter that was it and we go to church. And everybody, they're carrying their little purses, little girls carrying their little purses with their hats. Do you, you remember those days? And you're, I don't care if it was a Methodist church, I don't care if it was a Presbyterian church, I don't care if it was a Baptist church. They were all packed with people. But somewhere along the line, we got it in our head, we don't need church. And then it went into our heart. Something took our love and concern and care about people out of our heart. And something else went into our hearts. I remember my grandfather waking up early in the morning, getting the Word of God out and praying. Then we'd go to church. I always wanted to go in the swimming pool. I said, when can I? And my mother would say, you can't go swimming. It's called the baptistry. I says, well, I want to go up in the baptistry. I want to go in. I didn't know what a jacuzzi was because they didn't even exist in those days. And I remember my grandfather standing there with the songbook singing. Brings back good memories, precious memories. I'm glad that they instilled in my head, in my heart, now my hands. I never, I never, when I woke up this morning, preacher, I looked out the window, I'm thinking to myself, I never realized how enjoyable it is to do something that has a purpose. It's a privilege to preach. It's only by God's grace. I never imagined that I'd be a preacher, less a missionary. I didn't even know what a missionary was. And God called me. He selected me. He pulled me out of that horrible pit and set me on a rock. See, all of us have a place. My place is Costa Rica. My place this week is Seattle. Uh, two weeks ago, it was Chicago. I, I went into one of those areas I was telling you about this morning uh, uh, with the pastor. We went visiting. Led a lady to Christ about 8 o'clock in the evening. You say, you go on visitation? Yes. Because people are people, whether they be in someone else's Jerusalem, which is my outermost parts of the world, or if you come to Costa Rica with your pastor, you can go on visitation with me in the outermost parts of the world, which is my Jerusalem. You say, do you really believe it? Yes, that's why I live it. Because we live 
what you and I believe. The place, we all have a place. Then there's people. But in our heart, is there a passion? Is there compassion? These young ladies right here, this young man right here, there is no hope outside of the Word of God for them. You think it's bad now? You wait in 10, 15, 20 years. It's going to be real bad. You say, Yo, you're, a, you're a pessimist. No, I'm a realist. Because the Bible teaches it's only going to grow worse and worse, and it's growing worse and worse. We accept and we tolerate things today that we never would imagine. I can't even watch the TV because of some of the, the vulgarity just in the commercials. If my grandmother was ever to see that, whoa. Remember how they used to have the old saying, she'd turn over in her grave. Now we accept it, we tolerate it. Because our form of thinking has slowly moved away from the Word of God. There's no fear of the Lord today. Our hearts have changed from compassion for people. Do you remember the day when you'd walk by your neighbor and say, how are you doing, and call them by name? Today, you don't even know your neighbor. And if you talk to them, they, they think you want something and you're going to rob them. And in some areas, they probably don't even understand when you speak. I spoke to someone this morning. I said, how are you doing this morning? He says, you don't speak Spanish. You don't speak. And I don't speak uh, Korean. I don't speak Chinese. I don't speak Mandarin. I don't speak Tagalog. And I'll get on an airplane. And many times I don't understand the people. You go into a restaurant. That's why I love speaking Spanish. Because in most restaurants that I go to, the cook speaks Spanish. And you know what I do? I go back into the kitchen. Hola, que tal? Que me cuenta? Como estas? Hey, mire, yo tengo un favor. Me hacen un favor. Hágame un carne asada y hacen el carne más grande y más rica que hay. You say, what did you just say? I say, I go into the kitchen and I say, I want the biggest piece of beef that you have and the best piece of beef. And then I'm sitting out there with the other pastors and missionaries and when they serve the plate, I've got this big old piece of steak and they got, and I say, you have not because you ask not. And the reason why you ask not because you don't know how to speak the language. They said, that's a preference. I says, no, that's just the reality. It's the same in Christianity. If you don't have a passion for something, you watch when I eat. I have a passion when I eat. You watch me when I eat that pupusa. You watch me when I eat that kimchi. You watch me when, if there's some Indian food out there, you watch me when I eat that curry. You say, what will you eat? Anything that they feed me. Long as it's not moving too fast. Why? Because it identifies with people. See, we gotta come to where people are at. And we got to be willing to put our hands to the plow. Our hands tell something about ourselves. Look with me, if you would, in chapter 10. It says in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over the rich, and all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Missions is sending out preachers. Missions is sending out the word of God. Missions is proclaiming the gospel to every living creature. That's the commission of the church. Jesus' last words, Go ye therefore into all the world. First it has to get into our head. We got to recognize it. Then we have to receive it. Then we have to respond. Respond, hear my Lord, send me. Remember Isaiah chapter 6? Our hands, we use it. Say, is there any volunteer? Here am I. I'll be in the choir. 
Is there anyone to go visitation? Here am I. I'll go pass out a track. Is there anyone that will pray? I will pray. Is there anyone will give? I will give. Is there anyone? I will go. Because if it is recognized in our head and received in our hearts, we will respond in what we do. Here am I. 12 o'clock today. It's already April. Hard to believe. Time goes like this. But in God's plan, there is no time. There is no schedule. There's no agenda. It's eternity. What's more important? This temporary life that we live here trying to satisfy ourselves in place of responding to the need? I was telling Edwin yesterday, we passed by a fire bell, downtown Seattle. I stopped. I read it. It was the first fire company. They would ring the bell. Do you know they used to issue people fire buckets made out of leather because they were volunteer fire departments? And I looked at that bell yesterday. I think of myself, we're all firemen here. We're putting out the flames of hell in the lives of people. Grab a bucket. Grab some water. And let's put out the fire that we may rescue those that are perishing. People were willing to take a bucket and when there was a time of need, go to the fire and put it out. They issued buckets, leather buckets. Search it out, Google it, whatever you want to do. I know this, there is a lot of technology. Look at it. Everybody had a personal bucket. And that bucket was used for one purpose, to put out fires. Everybody has a Bible today? Go ye therefore in all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. That's my purpose. That's God's plan. His provision, he's given us the Holy Spirit. You saved? He's given us the Holy Spirit to go to the othermost parts of the world to reach the lost and dying world. Say, I can't go. You can give. How can you give? Give time to prayer. These things come forth by fasting and prayer. See, most of what you saw on those pictures are no more than prayer requests. How many times did I had to pray and God provided? I remember when my son was going through leukemia. My wife called me up and says, Honey, our dedu deductible we have to pay $3,000 or he can't get treatment. This was in 1995. I says, $3,000, our support was like uh, 1200 1100 I said, well, honey, don't worry about it. That's my responsibility. I was in Costa Rica. She was in Stanford up there uh, near San Francisco. I called Long Beach. And I asked the secretary, I says, is there any funds or any letters that you're holding till the end of the month? She goes, I have a, ch a, ch I have a letter here from Indiana, Pennsylvania. I says, would you open it up? And she opened it. I says, is there anything in it? She says, there's a check in here. I said, for how much? She said, $3,000. I says, deposit it in my wife's checking account as soon as you can. And I called my wife and says, honey, don't worry about it. Write the check. I says, she goes, what do you mean? I says, don't worry about it. I act like I knew what was going on, all right? And I'm thinking to myself, God, you're so good. But I still had to pay the payroll on the building. One of the men from the church came by that Thursday. He said, Pastor, I wasn't here last night because I was collecting some funds from a job I just did. Here is my tithe paid the payroll God never gives us more than we need but we never lack anything I've never seen the righteous forsaken or begging for bread we don't have to beg we have all that we need but what we do with what we have is very important God wants us to give our vessel
He wants us to become interested in the things. And when we become interested in the things he's interested in, and we get involved in the things that he's involved in, it's amazing how you will receive. And I'll speak about this in the banquet or the fellowship afterward. You must put him first. You must follow him. And there's some things that we need to forsake. This morning, or this afternoon now, my question for each one of us, what are we thinking about right now? Are we thinking about what we're going to be doing tomorrow? I always encourage our people, take three to five tracks. And when you get on the bus tomorrow, when you get to work, just hand them a track. Or when you're walking down, just hand someone a track. Always. This is our church track over there. You say, very nice. Yes, because it's very important. And you don't even have to know how to read. And you don't even have to know how to soul win. All you have to do is follow number one, number two, number three, number four. It's all laid out. You say, it's on, by, oh, look at that, how nice. Well, when you're in a country that has a lot of humidity, if you put a track in the body, you know what the track looks like? Not with this protection. Uh, one of my drug addicts, that's now a businessman, we never pay for our tracks. He buys tens of thousands of tracks every month or two. We reprint a different cover every time we do a publication. No one in Costa Rica is gonna accuse us of not telling them about Jesus Christ. Our church buys three things out of the mission account. We buy tracks, we buy chairs, and we buy offering plates. The tracks is to bring them in, to set them in the chair, to get them saved, and then collect money so we can send out more. I have a guy, he buys every offering plate on any church that starts. I have another guy, buys all the chairs. I have another guy, he'll buy all the tracks. I have them lining up saying, I want to be part of it. Because they've learned that investing in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is a profitable investment. You say, they do that in Costa Rica. Oh, yes. I'll have guys say, Pastor, you're in a missions conference. If you run across a missionary, and whatever you need, three, $5,000, just let me know. I'll give you the check. Praise the Lord. We held Bible colleges. The year when, you remember the recession when it hit here in uh, 80, uh, 97? No, 2007, 2008, remember when that? We gave over $30,000 to the Bible colleges to help them keep their doors open during the summer. Three, call 10,000. You say, why? We want to invest. And you should have seen all that God did for us. And I don't believe in the prosperity of the gospel, but I do believe of the blessings of God when you do what you're supposed to do. All we're supposed to do is follow. This morning, this morning, you recognize the need of people? Have you received the truth? Are you willing to respond saying, here am I? I'm going to do something this day for the cause of Christ because I'm interested in what he's interested in. I want to get involved in what the Lord was involved in. I want to invest in people. That's what it's all about. It's all about others. It's not about us, it's about others. We must prefer others more than ourselves. Is that in our head? Is that in our hearts? Is it in our hands to do so? When I was in the military, they asked for volunteers. And because I wanted to be a good soldier, had my gig line in order, I had my boots polished, had everything pressed out, starched out, and when they'd ask for volunteers, I'd always volunteer because I always wanted to get more involved. I wanted to be a good soldier. Well, I am a soldier now, a soldier of the cross. So are you. What are you involved in? What are you participating in? What do you want to get involved in? What do you want to invest in? Invest in the Lord's work and you'll never regret it. One day you'll thank those that preach the Word of God to get involved. You'll be very grateful to them. I'm glad someone taught me. I'm glad that I have the Bible that teaches me to get involved in something that has importance. 
no greater thing that we can do with our lives than to give it to the Lord, invest in His work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this morning, we thank you for Paul, how he spoke the truth, how was his conscience bared record to him, where that his heart had a continual sorrow, where he was willing to be a curse and that they'd be saved. We think of his heart's desire for the salvation of Israel. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ who gave himself as we celebrated several weeks ago, the crucifixion. Let us always be mindful of what you've done for us. This morning, Lord, I don't know what area you spoke to the hearts of the hearers. I pray and ask, Lord, as we've recognized the need of getting the gospel out, not only around the world, but here, in this area, in this state, in the United States. It's our personal responsibility. And the only way it's going to be accomplished is if we respond. Help us, Lord, to do an inventory, to examine, to analyze what's in our head, what's in our heart, what our hands are doing. We sing, we wish we would give them more, so much the more. Lord, help us to do more for Thee. No one looking around this morning. Perhaps you're not saved. Perhaps you don't know where your soul would go if you died today. I'd like to encourage you to let someone show you from the Word of God how to be saved. You may be visiting. I don't know who's a visitor. I don't know who's a member. Don't leave here without knowing that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for your sins. He paid it all. He gave himself a ransom that you might be saved. That's love. He recognized our sinful condition. Perhaps this morning you're here and you don't know where your soul would be eternally. I'd like to pray for you. Is there someone here say, pray for me, I don't know. Perhaps there's a young man, a young lady say, I don't know where I'd go if I died today. I know that I'm a sinner, but I don't know that heaven's my home. Would you pray for me? Is there someone here Lift up your hand. I'd love to pray for you. Is there someone here? Sir, ma'am, are you giving God your all? Your conscience bears record. Are you aware of the need? Does your heart have a continual sorrow for people in Europe, those immigrants, for people in Asia that doesn't have the liberty to have a church and to sing as we heard this morning or in some deprived areas where they basically have very little to nothing to eat and we will enjoy shortly an abundance of food. Are we compassionate for those people? Not for their physical need but for their spiritual need and then what are we willing to do? As Christians, our response, our responsibility is to reach them while we can. This morning, if God has spoken to your heart in Sunday school or the preaching this morning, say, I want to be a volunteer for Jesus. I want to do more. I want to be more productive with my life. I want to do more for the cause of Christ. I want to be someone that passes out tracts. I want to be someone that will go. I want to be someone that will give. I want to be a blessing to someone today. Make me a blessing, we sang. Well, we can be a blessing to someone. It starts in the head. It goes to the heart. And then it proceeds itself to our hands. In a moment, I'm going to ask you, if God's spoken to you and say, I want to do more. I'm going to do more. I will do more. God spoke to me. In an indication this morning, God's spoken to you. Say, pray for me. I am going to do what God's placed in my heart. Would you lift your hand in this moment? God bless you, sir. You, ma'am. You, ma'am. You, ma'am. You, sir. In a moment, 
the pianist is going to play, I'm going to ask everyone to stand to their feet. If you raised your hand, or if you didn't raise your hand, say, God spoke to me, I'm going to ask you, come to this old-fashioned altar. Would you please stand at this moment, every head bowed and every eye closed. If you raised your hand, sir, it doesn't matter. Uh, your age, it doesn't matter. Here at the altar is where God wants to meet with you. There's at least a dozen of you. This morning, if God spoke to you, I'm going to ask you, as the pianist plays this morning, come. It takes one to come, and then